wants to accomplish that purpose in your life today. It's good for us to be held accountable. And I doubt that any of us, when I say a sentence like that, I doubt that any of us feels real good about the idea of accountability because we know that that means some things. The word accountable means liable to be called to account, answerable to a superior, subject to pay or make good in case of loss. It's good for us to be accountable, and we can be accountable in many ways. We're accountable to the, to the law of the land, and if you drive your car and you speed, the policeman can pull you over, and you are accountable to breaking that speed limit. You're accountable to your boss at work, and if you're not doing your work, he can call you into account or she can call you into account, and, and you are liable to answer for that. It's good for us to be held accountable, and we don't like it because we do fail. We do break the laws, the rules, fail to uphold them, all of these things. And we don't like to be liable and answerable. We don't like to be subject to make good in case of loss. We know liable. I think about liable in the terms in the area of um, auto insurance. And you drive, if you drive a car, it's possible for you to make a mistake driving that car and cause an accident. And so you have to have liability insurance. Um, and when that happens and you cause the accident, your insurance has to pay for their damages because you caused it. You're liable. And so there's, there's a penalty here when we misstep, when we break the rules and so on. But if no one will call you into account... If you could break any rules you want and no one says anything, or if there is no enforcement of the law, somebody might say, hey, you broke the law here. Yes, I did. I'm, I'm gonna, you're, you're accountable. I'm going to call that out. That was wrong. Okay. But there's no penalty for it. You know, there's no enforcement of breaking those laws. If no one will call you into account or there's no enforcement of the laws when you are called into account, then really you're not accountable. We all have heard stories about people who broke the law and got off with a slap on the wrist or less. They weren't really accountable. We all, we all made a big issue about saying they were wrong, they broke the law, but then they, there's no payment, there's no enforcement of those laws, and there's no true accountability in that case. And when sinners are not accountable, the end result of that state is rampant depravity and destruction. And I, see, I think that we see both failures of accountability in our world today, don't we? People who can do, it seems, whatever they want, and they're not called into account. And then when people are called into account, nothing really happens. It's distressing to see, um, especially to see high-profile, um, well-known names, and they're all over, who have apparently broken laws, but they don't have to pay for them like someone like you and I would have to pay if we broke those laws. There's no accountability in those cases, and that's distressing to see. And the result of that kind of situation is an accelerating depravity. It's just getting worse and worse and worse, and it seems to multiply. And people think, and, and it makes logical sense, hey, if, if they're not accountable, why should I be? So if they can do that and get away with it, why can't I? And if we all think that, then we're going to find more and more wickedness and depravity, and that's what we're seeing in our world today. But even when men, humans, fail to hold each other accountable, God still holds everyone accountable. Hebrews 9.27 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We're going to be judged by God. We, we all have a time when we're going to leave this life. And some people die young, some people die old or in between. But for every one of us, we're going to stand before God one day. And Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And we've probably all done that with our parents when we were growing up. They were going to leave for a certain number of hours and they say, I expect you to clean your room or I expect you to do this responsibility. And when I come back, you're going to give account. We're going to, we're going to review if you did it or not. And we all know what that's like. And there's this deadline coming and maybe you didn't uh, do the work until five minutes before and you're scrambling because you know you're going to be accountable. 
And I'm afraid that many people go through their life and they don't think about giving account of themselves to God. Sometimes you can fool other people, your parents, your friends, but we're not going to fool God. All sinners will give account to God after this earthly life. And, but our accountability is not restricted to that distant time. Whenever we leave this life, then we're going to be accountable. No, we're, we're accountable in many ways already. It's good for us to be accountable, as I said. We have civil accountability, and that helps guard us from acting on our sinful lust. There would be more theft. There would be more murder. There would be more abuse of all kinds if there was absolutely no law and order. Spiritual accountability helps correct us when we sin. God speaks to our heart and says, that was wrong. That was wicked. Gives us guilt. God gave us a conscience, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. That is a God-given gift to help us remain accountable. We, have, we can have personal and inward accountability where we say, I'm going to live this way, I'm going to have this kind of life, this kind of habits, these kinds of routines, and I'm going to be accountable. I'm going to hold myself accountable to that. And when we have that kind of accountability, it helps keep us back from the edge, maybe, we would say, in, in different areas. I'm not going to go there because I'm holding myself accountable, and I'm going to stay back from that. We need accountability. And this flies in the face of what our world tells us. Our world says that we're all basically good people. Well, if we were good people, we wouldn't need accountability. We would just do good. We wouldn't need laws. We would do good without the laws. But the laws are that accountability, that enforcement, because we naturally do not live that way. In Genesis chapter 3, we find God moving swiftly to hold man accountable. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Genesis chapter 3. Of course, we know that this is in the Garden of Eden. And before Adam and Eve, the first couple, before they sinned, there was no enforcement. There was no need for accountability to be put into action. We know that we're accountable before God. And God doesn't, God doesn't bring us up and make us stand before him right now. That moment is coming. And so he's keeping track. He's watching. And so in, in that sense, when we, when we think about standing before God, that accountability hasn't been put into action yet. It's there. God's watching. But we haven't actually come to that moment of accountability. And before Adam and Eve sinned, they were accountable. God was watching. They were responsible to obey God. But there was no need for them to be brought up before God because they'd never sinned. They hadn't done anything wrong. There was no reason for them to be liable for wrong actions. He was answerable to God, but there was nothing wrong to answer for yet. But of course, all that changed after Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God held them accountable. And let's read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and, and we covered these verses last week, but to kind of set the stage for the text that we'll be looking at a little bit later in the chapter. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, which God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. And this was their sin. God said, don't eat of it. And they disobeyed God. Verse 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? 
And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to see our accountability before you. And it's illustrated so very clearly in this chapter that man is accountable to God. We're not going to escape your watchful eye. We're not going to break your laws and escape observation or judgment for that sin. You hold us accountable because you are a holy God and a fair God and a righteous God. You are a good judge and you must judge sin. And you must hold us accountable. And so I pray that we would have a healthy fear of God because we are sinners. Help us to reverence God and to understand that you do hold us accountable, but that you have a payment for our sin so that you don't have to judge us. I pray that you would teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to see, first of all, that sin separates sinners. And this is a terrible side effect terrible result of sin. It separates us. It separates us from a lot of things. When Adam and Eve sinned, they knew it. And and you think about um, harmony and fellowship and friendship, all of these things that we enjoy in life. It's, It's a blessing to be with friends. It's a blessing to have unity. It's a blessing to have camaraderie and we work together and we're we're spending time together and we're like-minded and we're moving forward and there are all different areas of life where this can be true and when that's true and we experience that it's a great thing and Adam and Eve had that they didn't ever let each other down they didn't ever wrong each other they didn't ever have uh, they didn't lose their temper um, they were innocent they, they they were like children in their in their unawareness of wrong. They didn't have the knowledge of good and evil. And so it was a wonderful place. They were in the perfect Garden of Eden that God created for them. And they had daily fellowship with God. There was, there was nothing, we talk about paradise, the word utopia is thrown around. And, and we, we imagine this wonderful place, and that's what the Garden of Eden was like. It was a wonderful place, a wonderful place to live. And they enjoyed all of this, and then they sinned. They did what God said not to do. The one thing that God told them not to do, they did it. And I just, I just imagine that when they ate that fruit, instantly they were condemned by their own conscience. It was like setting off a siren in their brain. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And their, their peace was shattered. And their newly acquired knowledge of good and evil made an immediate impact. The serpent had said, you shall be as gods. This is going to be a really good thing for you to know good and evil. But it says in verse 7, the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. They immediately knew, oh no, I'm not, I'm not dressed properly. It wasn't a good, the first thing they noticed was not a good thing. It was, it was an awareness of, of shortcoming, and, and I've been missing something, and God, God didn't hold them responsible for that. We've got small children in our house, and the real young ones, they're unaware when they're, when they're improperly dressed. They, in fact, they even seem to enjoy it because it's freedom and all of this, and, and they're innocent. They're like they're, they're children, and Adam and Eve, they weren't aware that clothing was necessary. They, they were blissfully unaware. They were innocent. There was no knowledge that anything was missing here. 
But when they took that fruit and they took for themselves something that God did not provide for them, something that God did not intend for them, in this case, he had, he had prohibited it, they immediately, yes, they, they did learn something. They did gain knowledge of something. But it wasn't a pleasant effect. They knew that they were naked and they felt shame. And so they tried to cover that up to, to get rid of their shame. I think that, that this example here is compelling evidence for the effectiveness of God's gift of conscience. And people can sear their conscience. Sometimes adults commit sins, especially adults, commit sins, and they're not guilty about it. They don't feel bad about it at all. In fact, they, they even try to do those things. Um, I, I've read about other cultures, in, in, especially in, in the past, and theft and violence is encouraged and celebrated. And I believe that is not how it started out for them those people. They, they had to sear their conscience because um, break, those are breaking God's laws. We look at the Ten Commandments, for instance, and we see thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. These things are not okay. God holds us accountable, but humans can get to the point where they don't feel guilty about doing these things because they have been searing their conscience, just like you, if you put your hand on a hot burner, it burns your hand, it really hurts, and then you, you can't feel anything. So if you were to put it back, it might not hurt so much because you've lost that sense of feeling. And that's we can do that to our conscience. But Adam and Eve had not done this. They were new at this sin thing. They did not have a seared conscience. And so they felt that guilt and that weight of sin much more heavily, I believe, than you and I do. They had never felt this before. It was a brand new thing. And we know this to be true when our conscience is afflicting us. Maybe, maybe you're engaged in, in tax fraud. You don't pay your taxes. Or maybe, maybe you're, you are avoiding uh, doing your, your work, your job at work. And you're finding ways to, to, to slough off and, and, and you're kind of avoiding people so you don't get found out. When we're, when we're engaged in ongoing wrongdoing and our conscience is afflicting us, it causes this inward struggle and it isolates us. I, I read about... And, I, and I've heard people speak about um, different moral perversion that can be found on the internet, so to speak, and, or for example. And when people are engaged in that, it causes people, it causes them to isolate themselves and to keep it hidden. And to, it, the sin wants to go underground, so it's not found out. And when, we, when that happens, we distance ourselves from other people because I have a guilty secret and I don't want anyone to know. And now we're isolated from each other. We're also isolated from God. We've probably all heard the saying, there is no honor among thieves. And, and there can be a gang or a mob, a group of thieves, and they seem to be real tight. They're good friends, but, but then they can fight over the loot and the bounty because ultimately they're in it for themselves. And that selfishness isolates us from other people. And Adam and Eve, we're, we're experiencing this as well. And we see how they immediately started pointing fingers. When God held them accountable, they weren't a unified husband and wife team anymore. They were pointing fingers. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It, sin was isolating and distancing themselves from each other. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is what happens when we embrace sin and reject obedience to God. Some, when, we, when we have guilt in our heart, it creates tension. And when we're guilty, we try to alleviate that tension through denial or through justification of ourselves. Well, it wasn't my fault. It, through concealment, we try to change the rules. Adam and Eve knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They were trying to fix their problem. Oh, I, I just realized I have a problem here. I never saw this before. Let me fix it. Let me, let me resolve this. But we know that man's attempts... We need to understand this. When you are guilty over your sin, nothing you do can remove that guilt. You can try to justify yourself. You can get other people to justify you, but it won't remove that guilt because that guilt is not created by humans, by man, by others. That guilt 
is a gift from God. Only he can take away your guilt. And yet we turn to human means to try to get rid of our guilt, and it never will. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve had already tried. They'd made aprons. They were fine now, right? Their, their nakedness is covered. Everything's great. But what happened when they heard the voice of the Lord? It says, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Why did they hide themselves? They were fine now, right? No, they weren't. Their guilt was not gone. They tried to cover it up. They tried to, to fix it and to make it better. But instead, when God came looking for them, they isolated themselves from him. And this is what always happens. Our sin makes us guilty, and there's nothing that can take away our guilt that we can accomplish. We understand that a conscience can, can really be a big help to us. When it's working... It doesn't feel good, and so we don't like that sensation. But we ought to be thankful for that. What kind of, to what depths would we sink if we didn't have a conscience? If you could do anything you wanted and you never felt any compunction, we would be just like the animals. You watch animals, and, and it's horrible. If we, if we try to hold animals to godly morals, we are appalled at how they behave, because they're animals. And they do just what they do. And there's, there's no guilt because they don't have a conscience. They don't have, a, uh, have a, an eternal spirit. But man does. We don't like feeling guilty. But our, our guilty conscience protects us from going deeper into sin. Only fools disregard their conscience and sear their conscience. Adam and Eve knew that they were guilty. But I'm thankful that God didn't leave them alone. He saw when they sinned, and he could have just stepped back and not come looking for them and just left them to themselves. He could have done that, but he didn't, and I'm thankful for that. He came to hold them accountable and confront them, and this is why. Because on the other side, accountability and confrontation is not comfortable. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. When we do wrong, we do not want to be held accountable. When you sin, you don't want anyone to know. When we break the law, we don't want to pay for it. But on the other side of accountability and confrontation is the potential for repentance and forgiveness. And that is a good thing. We don't like accountability. But when we respond to accountability the right way, we can have forgiveness. I, uh, sin separates sinners. But thankfully, secondly, God seeks sinners. Look at verse 9. The Lord God is coming. They hear his voice. And in verse 9 it says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? God was drawing near to Adam. He was seeking Adam. Of course, God knew where Adam was, but he was, he was wanting to, to fellowship, speak with Adam, converse with Adam. I'm reminded of John 6, where the Lord Jesus Christ says, No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. The Father draws sinners to Christ. God was seeking Adam, and he wants to draw sinners to himself. We are the guilty ones. We are the ones who have offended God, and yet God wants to draw us to himself. I'm thankful that he does that. I'm thankful that he seeks sinners. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. If God did not seek after Adam and Eve here, they would have remained isolated from him. They would have remained separated. If God did not seek us, we would remain guilty and condemned. Sin burrows underground. It hides from God and it isolates itself from everyone else eventually. It's a silent killer. It eats you from the inside out. That's what sin does in our hearts. Sin is not isolation. Isolation is our response to our guilt. If you don't have anything to be ashamed of, there's no reason to isolate yourself. And people, we're, we are social creatures and we, we naturally crave company. But when you're guilty and you're in sin and you don't want to be caught, you naturally isolate yourself. I've talked about this. Our, our conscience is giving us the verdict of guilty and we isolate ourselves and we hide in our unrepentant response to that guilty verdict. And so 
God has to seek after us because we are not coming after him. We don't want to be found out, and I'm thankful that he seeks us. And why does he seek us? Because he's wanting to restore us, and he wanted to restore Adam here. He said in verse 9, where art thou? Where are you? He knew where he was, but he wanted Adam to answer. He was looking for Adam. He didn't say, um, what were you thinking, Adam? I saw what you did. What's, what's wrong with you? That would have maybe pushed Adam farther away. Instead, he was drawing Adam to himself. Where are you? I want to find you. I want to talk to you. I want to see you. I'm thankful that the Lord seeks to restore us. Turn to Romans chapter 5, and we see this spirit of God, uh, this, this attitude, this approach that God has still seeking sinners. God sought Adam, and, and in Genesis we find so many uh, truths that are presented, precedents that are set that are still true. They're still true of God, still true of sinners. We still sin. We still isolate ourselves. We try to justify ourselves. And in the meantime, we hide from God, but he comes seeking us. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. People might be willing to die for a, a, a real righteous and good man, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I'm thankful that God wants to restore us, but in order for him to restore us sinners, Christ had to die for us. I'm thankful that God seeks sinners. I'm thankful that God confronts sinners. Let's look back at Genesis chapter 3, and we see God confronting Adam. This is part of accountability. God is holding Adam accountable, and God confronts sinners. He signals a problem here in verse 9. It says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he, Adam, said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Adam, I believe, had never missed a meeting with the Lord. This was not the first time that God had come to fellowship with, with Adam in the garden, but this was the first time that Adam had hid himself. And so the Lord God said, where are you, Adam? Hey, what's going on? You know, we've never had this problem before. Where are you? And Adam Adam answered, but he gave an interesting answer. He said, I heard your voice and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. There's a problem here. It's interesting. If you turn to Psalm 32, Psalm 32 appears to have been written by David during the time when he had sinned with Bathsheba. And you understand that, you remember that, that example in his life, that, that time in his life. He made some very poor choices. He allowed his lust to get out of control, and he took another man's wife. And then when she became with child, he had her husband killed so that he could marry her and no one would suspect a thing. He, he put her husband into the, the, the front lines of the battle, and then, and then when he died, he took... Uh, Bathsheba to be his wife and thought he had gotten away with it. But the Bible says the thing that he had done displeased the Lord. And in Psalm 32, verses 1 through 4, we see two different states of a man's conscience. And I believe that, that David is referring to this time that he experienced after his sin. Verse 1 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. That is a blessed state to be forgiven, whose sin is covered, to, be, to have no guile and no iniquity put on your account. Contrasted with verse 3, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. God's hand was heavy on David and he was guilty. He was walking around with this burden and it was as if there was this, this terrible conflict and tumult inside of him and it just wore him out. It aged him. The, the moisture, you think about the, the spring rains and April showers bring May flowers, and we know that's, that saying. And, and what we're talking about is the water, the rain, it encourages growth and things turn green and flowers sprout and, 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 and 
the leaves come out on the trees and it's a beautiful thing contrasted with the hot days of summer and, and the grass can get a little crispy and, it, and things are turning brown because it's so dry. There's a big difference between those things and David is making this illustration that what should have been uh, a wonderful time and I had all these blessings, all those blessings were turned into barrenness because of my guilt because of the affliction of my conscience. God's hand was heavy upon him. And God was making a point to David, you can't get away with this. You can't be joyful. You can't be at rest. You can't be at peace because you're in sin. You committed sin. You've offended God. You've broken God's laws. God's holding David in that example accountable. And we know the story. The, 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 the prophet Nathan came to David and said, thou art the man. You've committed this sin. You're guilty. And David repented. He was confronted by God and he repented. And so then he could say in verses 1 and 2, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. When you've been through that guilt and then you've been forgiven, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful gift. But God was holding Adam accountable. Where are you? And Adam truthfully answered God's question. He said, I was afraid. And I hid myself. Because I was naked and I knew that you don't approve of that. So, you know, that's a true answer. But it wasn't the root of the issue. It wasn't the real problem. Adam's real problem was not his nakedness. Because he had been naked for a while now. God hadn't told him about clothing. He hadn't felt guilt about that. He wasn't afraid for that. That wasn't his real problem. And God put, put his attention on that. Genesis chapter 3. Let's turn back there and let's see... Verse 11, Adam said in verse 10, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. In verse 11 he said, and he, and he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? You didn't figure this out on your own. You didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, there's something missing here. Who told you? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Who told you? Sometimes... It's easy for us to take things personally. And I think about how God could have taken, he couldn't have because he's God, but, but, but Adam said, I heard you and I was afraid. What's that saying about God? Isn't that a terrible thing? Afraid of God as though God's some evil being. God's some dangerous, dangerous uh, entity and Adam should hide because he's in danger. No, that, that was not right. God didn't take it personally. He didn't make it about him. Why are you afraid of me? What have I ever done to you? He didn't, he didn't approach that. He just kept putting the focus on Adam. This isn't about me. You shouldn't be afraid of me. The problem is yours. Who told you you were naked? Who, have, you, have you eaten of the tree? He's putting the, prob, he's putting the focus right where it ought to be, on Adam's sin. Who told thee? Did you break the commandment? Did you disobey me? And it's a, it's a piercing question. It gets right to the root of the issue. Because that was Adam's real problem. His, real pro his, his deepest problem was not that he was hiding from God. It wasn't that he was afraid of God. It wasn't even, you know, the fact that he was trying to cover up his nakedness or anything like that. It was the fact that he had eaten the fruit and disobeyed the Lord. I'm thankful that even though we get sidetracked or preoccupied with issues that aren't the real issues, God still gets to the root of the issue. We can't escape it. We try to distract. We try to, to say that our problem is this other thing over here, but God knows how to put his finger right on it. And it was a simple yes or no question that he asked Adam. Have you eaten of the tree? Very simple question. Very simple answer. And how did Adam respond? Well, he responded very typically to how we sinners do it. Hast thou eaten of the tree, where have I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? There are only two options for answering this question directly. Yes or no? And what did Adam say? Verse 12, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Well, well Lord, you know, that question is an interesting question, and, and it brings up another couple of issues here. Let me, let me just tell you, um, the woman that you gave me, Okay, you, you provide it, let's, let's go on record, let's remember, you gave her to me now, Lord, she gave me the fruit. So, so part of the issue is yours, Lord, and, and this woman, I mean, you, you, should, you should live with her for a while. She gave me this fruit, and yeah, I, I ate of the fruit. But let's talk, Adam was deflecting. 
He was deflecting from the real issue. The right answer was, yes, Lord, I ate the fruit. I disobeyed you. I did what I knew was wrong. Yes, I ate the fruit. I sinned. That was the right answer. But it wasn't the answer he gave. He was technically correct in what he said. God did give Eve to Adam. Adam did give the fruit, or Eve gave the fruit to Adam. Adam was technically correct, but he did not accept his blame and remain quiet. Instead, he put the attention on someone else. And we often do this as well. Well, yeah, okay, I, I shouldn't have, but, but they're, they're just being hypersensitive about this. I mean, okay, sure, I'm not perfect, but if they weren't so hypersensitive, they're misinformed. It's really not as that, that bad. Well, you know, I'm a victim in this situation. It's not my fault. It's not really my fault. that it, They caused me to sin. If they hadn't done that, or have you, have you noticed their sin? I mean, their sin is so much worse than mine. Let's not talk about me here. It's really their issue. Yeah, I'm a sinner. It's just, but it's, it's not that bad, okay? I know I've done some things. Yeah, I'm not proud of everything I'm done, but I've done, but it's really not that bad. Or I, I didn't know it was wrong. I, I didn't realize it, so it's, it's, it's not a problem. If they hadn't been out of line, then neither would I have been. You know, this is all just being blown out of proportion, we all, we, we have this tendency too, don't we? Deflect. Yeah, we know we're wrong, but, and we deflect. Adam was doing this. What about this? When God holds us accountable, or when the authorities hold us accountable, what about this answer? I'm sorry. I was wrong when I did this thing. I should have done this other thing instead. Will you please forgive me? Just answering it honestly, directly, I accept all responsibility. Nobody else made me sin. I chose to sin. Now, somebody might have an influence on me, but nobody makes my choice to sin except me. Only I chose to sin. Nobody else made me sin. When we deflect, we, we are deflecting accountability. I shouldn't be accountable for this because of these other things. And as a result, when we deflect accountability and we try to avoid it, we also refuse resolution and restoration. If we're not going to be held accountable, then we can't be restored. We can't resolve the issue either. I'm thankful, though, that God doesn't give up on us when we deflect blame and we avoid him. Adam I don't know what Adam was thinking, but as far as what he was doing here, he was doing everything he could to, to remain isolated from God. He was hiding from God. He was afraid of God. And when God spoke to him, he tried to avoid blame and accountability. He was doing everything he could to keep the sin and the offense right where it was and not remove it. But God didn't give up. God didn't say, oh, okay, well... I guess I'll quit trying. You're not being honest with me, Adam. I asked you a question. I'm coming to find you, and all you do is deflect. Okay, fine. Have it your way. He didn't do that. I'm thankful that he didn't do that. He is long-suffering to us. He doesn't give up on us. He is patient and long-suffering. He, he confronts not only Adam, but he confronts all sinners in this situation, and he still confronts all sinners. Look at what he says. God, Adam said, The woman thou gavest to be with me. At, uh, God, God didn't stop and address that at this moment. He went on to Eve. Verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She's just following Adam's example. She's avoiding accountability. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I'm thankful that God confronts all sinners. God, I, I need God to confront me. It doesn't feel good, but I need it. And you need God to confront you. And I'm thankful that when people sin against you, and when you sin against others, God's going to hold everybody accountable. 
God's going to take vengeance on all sin. God's going to right all the wrongs. He's going to hold everyone accountable. Every sin will be paid for. Hebrews 2, 2 says, Every transgression and disobedience receives a just re recompense of reward. God is, is keeping track. So you don't have to worry about so-and-so getting away with something. God's going to hold them accountable, but he's also going to hold you accountable and hold me accountable. We don't have to worry about God ignoring problems or overlooking sin. He will confront and reward all sin and sinners. And reward isn't always a positive thing in this, in this connotation. God judges sinners as well. He confronts all sinners, but he judges sinners as well. And we see this judgment coming on the serpent first. God starts with him, and we just read the verse, you are cursed above all cattle. You're going to crawl on your belly. And we see serpents doing that. And, and I think probably, maybe, I assume, throughout all of human history, Servant, uh, serpents, snakes, have been on the top ten of most hated creatures for all people. Not, not every person hates them that way, but I sure do. And I think most people don't, don't like snakes. They're, they're disgusting creatures. And I think it has something to do with this. The snake, the serpent is cursed. And it's still a creature that God created. But the serpent itself is cursed. And also we see some spiritual, uh, some spiritual consequences as well. God talks about the seed of the woman bruising the head of the serpent and the serpent bruising the heel of the seed of the woman. And that is a prophecy re regarding Christ. Christ was crucified and that was, had this effect of bruising the heel. It's painful, but it's not debilitating. Christ died. He was in the tomb for three days and three nights, but then he rose again and he defeated sin. And Satan, the serpent, is a defeated creature. He is, he is already lost and he's still fighting, but one day he's going to be vanquished forever in the lake of fire. He is a defeated foe. We see the woman being judged in verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. He says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. And that, that word sorrow means anxiety and grief and toil. And probably all you moms know what it's like to worry about your children. And to, to, to labor and toil. And it's, 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 it can be a hard life at times. And that is what God is talking about. He says, sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth thy children. We know that labor and delivery is a very painful and difficult time. It's a sorrowful, it's a laboring time. But God also put the woman under the man, which is part of the curse. You don't have to amen that woman, that late ladies, wives. You don't. <laughs> but it is part of the curse. Um, God ordains it, but I do feel sorry sometimes for my wife having to, having to put up with me um, because husbands are imperfect and we have flaws, we make mistakes, we do wrong. No matter how hard we try, it's not always a pleasant thing for a wife to follow her husband, but it's what God has ordained. We see God's judgment on the man in verses 17 to 19. Unto Adam, because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife and hast eaten of the tree, thou cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. You're going to have to work hard. It's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Life is going to be hard. Life is going to be difficult. The ground was cursed, and it was Adam's job to take care of it. The ground is going to bring forth the wrong kinds of plants. Thorns and thistles, you're going to have to work hard and get rid of those things. Life is going to get a lot more difficult. You're going to make your living in sorrow, this anxious, grieved toil. And life is like that. It's difficult. It's hard. He says basically in verse 19, you're going to have a life full of work until you die. And then you're going to return to dust. And notice he says, for, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And this is a stinging reminder that what the serpent promised in verse 5 is false. The serpent said to Eve, ye shall be as gods. You eat this fruit, you're going to be just like the gods. You're going to be an ascended being. Everything's going to be great. And God says, no, you're dust. 
I formed you out of the dust of the ground, and you're going to go back to that after you die. You're not a god. You're not anything more than I created you to be. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't listen to the lies of the serpent. What God says is true. He is always true. He is always right, and sin is always a lie. Sin promises pleasure, and it never delivers what it promises. Think about these punishments. They were heavy punishments. Adam had hundreds of years left to live. He lived to be 930, I think. I had, have to double-check that, that number. Over 900 years old. And all of those years would be lived under the curse. It's a long time. We feel like 80 years is a long time. How about 900-some? A long time to live from remembering the perfect Garden of Eden. And now, because of his sin, he had this. Eve had yet to give birth. She hadn't had one child born yet. Every child that she would have would be under the curse. And all of, their, all of their children would be born under these conditions. Do you think they were still glad they ate the fruit? I don't think so. I think the regret started immediately. And this is how it, be, this is how it is with us. Sin lies to us. It promises a wonderful reward but the momentary pleasure from sin evaporates very quickly and it leaves only pain. But I'm thankful that's not the end of the account. That's not the end of the story. I'm glad God holds us accountable. I'm glad he confronts us. But I'm especially glad that God restores sinners. Look at verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? Fig leaves, any kind of leaf, fig leaves, dry up and become, become brittle and they fall apart. Aprons made out of fig leaves are not a good uh, solution for clothing. God made a much better solution. He made coats of skins and clothed them. God clothed them. He knew they had a problem. He knew they needed clothing now. And he did it. He could have left Adam and Eve to wallow and struggle in their problems, but he didn't. He could have deserted them to figure out their own solutions, but he didn't. He didn't ignore their nakedness problem. He solved that problem. He came up with a much better solution than they could have, and this is what he still does. People try to make up for their faults. They try to cover up and think that it's fine, and God, doesn't, God sees that it's not fine. He doesn't want us to stay there. He's got a much better solution. We just need to let him confront us and repent and let him bring his solution into our lives. The solution for the sin problem involves bloodshed. How do you make a coat of animal skins unless you kill the animals first? We're seeing that pattern introduced here, and that is still the pattern. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Without shedding of blood is no remission, the Bible says. The penalty for sin is death. Blood must be shed. And that's what happened here. The an animals had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed. And God is still clothing people. Listen to Isaiah 61.10, which says, I will rejo greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. God wants to clothe us. He clothed Adam and Eve with these animal skins, much better than the, the fig leaves that they were trying to sew together. And God wants to clothe us, not with physical clothing, but with a robe of righteousness, a spiritual garment. We can't do it ourselves. He wants to do it. Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. God says, I have a solution for you and I want to clothe you. It's called salvation. But we have to take on his solution. We have to come to him and admit our sin and turn from our sin and trust in Christ alone. We need accountability because our sin isolates us from God and others. We need to be accountable to God because he seeks us and confronts us. 
to get at the real problem. We need accountability. Even when we are judged for our sin, because that is the path to restoration. We need to be accountable. If we try to avoid accountability and judgment, we won't have restoration. We will never be right with God. If you try to explain away your sin and justify it and say it's really not that bad, you will never be right with God. Let's be accountable to God. Let's embrace it. When we humble ourselves and we admit our sin and we repent of our sin, we turn our back on it and turn to God, we will be restored into fellowship with Him. And then we can stay in that fellowship and be so glad. We don't have to carry that regret around, that guilty conscience. We don't have to live in that. We can be restored if we are still, if we are first held accountable. Accountability to God is a good thing. It was good for Adam and Eve, and it's good for us. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to be accountable to you. Help us not to run from our guilt, but to come to you and admit it. Confess and forsake our sin, confess and repent of our sin, acknowledge our sin, so that you can restore us, so that you can cleanse us, so that you can save us. You already know that we're guilty, but you want us to admit it, to know it, and acknowledge it, and not deflect it, not try to escape it, not try to hide it, but just to to be honest with you and come to you so that you can cleanse us, so that you can clothe us in your righteousness. And when we're right with God, we can be right with each other as well. We don't have to have the separation of sin between us. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Help us to be honest about these things. Thank you for this example in Adam and Eve that you're still demonstrating in our lives. We grieve over sin, but we're thankful that you seek sinners so that you can judge sin and then restore us. Help us to be honest with you. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and bless the next service in just a few minutes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for your attention. We'll we'll have the 11 o'clock service in just a few moments. You're dismissed until then. Thank you.